me share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can try to keep it high. Uh, do you want people to ask questions during the talk? Or do you want to prefer to have them at the end? No, I don't mind uh, during the talk. Yeah. Also. I, I, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat and the raised hands if there are something, but I'll, otherwise, I guess, just yes. yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Arne. So um, today I'll be talking a bit about what uh, we at the Schweder Lab are doing uh, in the direction of um, prediction of protein ligand complexes. Um, and so I think I don't need to like overstate the importance of this, like uh, being able to predict uh, where ligands bind and how ligands bind to proteins is kind of essential for understanding protein function, also engineering it and manipulating it uh, for uh, diseases and so on. Um, and there's kind of a lot of aspects uh, to protein ligand binding. So it's um, there's a lot of different angles at which uh, you can look at this. So we have examples, for instance, in the PDB of uh, crystallized protein ligand complexes, which have a really wide diversity in terms of what kinds of proteins are there, and also what kinds of small molecules or peptides or uh, saccharides and so on are there. Uh, and you have a lot of cases where a protein without a ligand is in a completely different conformation than when it actually uh, is in the ligand bound form. Um, you can have different pockets uh, for different kinds of ligands. You, for instance, you have uh, more like weak interactions which are at the surface or you have really deep cavities that uh, bind very long ligands uh, where certain residues are really important because they're the ones that mediate the interaction with the ligand. Um, and all of this is sort of coming into play when you were actually trying to predict the protein ligand complex, so the, the pose of the ligand within the protein structure. And so I'll cover a lot of different aspects uh, of what we've done, um, but I'll start from more of a historic thing. So what we did first and then next and then so on. So maybe this will only make sense at the end. So I'll come back to this slide. Um, so a lot of this started with CASP15. So two years ago in CASP15, we um, there was a pilot experiment in the prediction of protein ligand interactions, so predicting protein ligand complexes uh, that we were involved in uh, the organization of and the assessment uh, of this category. And in the same, around the same time, let's say uh, Xavier, who maintains Camillo, uh, was looking into extending Camillo to also handle protein ligand complex prediction. And uh, just, to, I think everyone here maybe knows what CASP is. So that's the critical assessment of structure prediction. And it happens <laughs> once every two years, as our name mentioned at the beginning, it's happening sort of now, starting now. Um, but I'll give you a short overview of Camillo for those who haven't heard it. Uh, so Camillo is essentially a weekly mini CASP, you could say, uh, which takes advantage of the of the PDB release cycle. So the PDB, I think, I never know, I think it's on Thursdays, um, pre-releases the sequences and the smiles of the structures that will be released on the next Monday. So you essentially have a four day period where everyone is blind to the structure, but they have the sequence. And uh, if in the case of lagging complex is also the smiles. So in that four day window, automated prediction servers can do their predictions or structures of complexes. Uh, and, and you can do an automated assessment of these predictions uh, once the models come out uh, during the release. Um, so this is what happens uh, in Camillo. Uh, and it's a weekly thing because this happens every week with the PDB release. And so, um, the thing that sort of changes with uh, protein ligand complex prediction compared to, for instance, docking or, or, or just structure prediction is that you now have this, your prediction target is essentially a complex with one or more protein chains or DNA chains or RNA chains uh, and one or more uh, small molecules uh, in there. And your model, your predictors, try to predict this entire thing. So maybe they uh, miss one of the protein chains, um, but essentially the idea is to predict this whole complex of all the protein chains and all the small molecules in there. 
Um, and so you need a way to evaluate this to assess how good the prediction is. And so for this, uh, for CASP 15 uh, PLI, we developed two scores. Uh, one is it's called binding site superposed symmetry corrected RMSD. And the reason that this is different from just RMSD, let's say, of, of ligand poses is that now the binding pocket is also predicted. So it's not that you have a nice reference frame that you know how to compare the ligands. You first need to be able to superpose the predicted model in blue over here with the target structure based on the binding pocket. So that's why it's binding pocket superposed. Um, and then once the superposition is done, you compute the RMSD uh, between the, the small molecules or the ligands. But this is also not uh, a one-to-one -one mapping because uh, unlike proteins in small molecules, you have cases where there are symmetries. So in this particular example, all these three atoms could map to any of these three atoms. So you kind of need to pick the best mapping that uh, gives the prediction the higher score because all of these are correct mappings. Um, so that's from, let's say, a rigid score, a superposition-based score, and that's uh, while there is some protein aspect in there because you're superposing based on the binding pocket, the score is calculated then on the ligand. Uh, we also, uh, so we developed also LDDT PLI, so the local distance difference test for protein ligand interactions. Uh, and this is basically a, an LDDT kind of score, which looks basically at distances only, uh, but only for the contacts between the ligand and the receptor. So essentially, given a prediction, you check all of the protein residues which are near uh, ligand atoms, get the distances of those, and then see how well those distances are uh, reproduced in, um, in the prediction. Uh, and so I'll show some examples of how these two work together in a second. And just as almost like a an addition to the LDDT PLI was also LDDT LP, which is the LDDT of the ligand pocket, uh, which is just the same kind of thing, but just looking at the binding pocket residues, how well are the distances conserved uh, without the ligand in the picture. Um, and so here are some examples of comparing these two, uh, LDDT PLI and the uh, RMSD. Um, and so when predictions are good, I think both of them more or less agree. So these are examples where, apart from the first one, are more examples where you might see the differences between the two. On average, they mostly really well agree with each other. Um, but here, for example, you might say that the RMSD is on a higher side, but since the interaction is actually conserved, the LDBT PLI is high. Uh, it's the distance between the... Uh, atom and the ligand. And this, you, you can maybe imagine that this sort of applies when you have, um, let's say, ligand or small molecules, which are half of them is within the pocket, and then the other half is sort of floating in space, not contacting any protein. Do we really know what the right answer is there? Do we really want a predictor to exactly get the flappy part as it was in the structure when it's not interacting with anything? And uh, that's the kind of thing that LDDT PLI can help give a different perspective to. So it would only try to match uh, the parts that are actually interacting with the protein. Um, here's an example where the side chain is flipped. So even though the RMSD seems low, uh, the LDDT PLI would be a bit higher. Uh, this was a very interesting case where somehow the predictor managed to get an atom way in space. Uh, and this is sort of just an example of how this you know, the RMSD would be like 70. So then if you take uh, an average of many predictions to rank predictors, then this would really bring the average up, uh, whereas this is more bounded from zero to one. Um, and here's an example where the prediction actually needed to have two chains. So one or two protein chains, one on this side and one on this side. And uh, sorry, the target had two protein chains and this prediction only had one. So this chain was not predicted and that was penalized because it's making contacts with the ligand. Okay, um, so all of this is implemented in open structure. So now we actually have uh, this full suite of scores to go from this uh, kind of prediction target where you have any number of receptor ligand chains 
um, that which need to be mapped to your uh, to the model because it's uh, some may be missing, some may be placed in different ways, uh, and this is all now implemented in Open Structure. And um, you can also register if you have a protein lag and complex predictor or any kind of structure predictor to the beta version of Cameo um, to uh, get these protein lag and prediction targets and see how it goes uh, for the weekly pre-DB releases. Okay, so then we wanted to look into how do these new methods uh, that are coming out every day basically uh, especially the deep learning ones for predicting protein lagging complexes or the all atom kind of predictors, uh, how are they doing at the task? Uh, what do we need in order to see how well they're doing and how well are they actually doing? Um, and so these are some examples of, I think DiffTalk was one of the first ones. And uh, there's now Neuroplexer, Dynamic Bind, there's Rosetta Fold All Atom and so on. And these range from methods which to diff, uh, rigid docking, which is like diff dock, where you need to know the, or you give the structure of the receptor and it places the ligand in there. Uh, there's more like flexible docking where you give the structure of the receptor, but then the pocket residues may change and then you put the ligand in there. Um, or co-folding where you give the sequence of the receptor and just the smiles of the ligand and it co-folds the entire protein ligand complex. Um, and so Michelle made this uh, nice automated um, benchmarking workflow to uh, assess these different methods using the uh, LDT PLI, RMSD, and uh, LDT LP scores. Uh, and this is basically handling a lot of uh, pre processing steps that need to be done for especially the physics based uh, prediction uh, docking methods. So um, preparing the ligand, making sure it has the right protonation state, preparing the receptor, making sure it has hydrogens added, uh, predicting binding sites, because a lot of these methods take advantage of uh, any kind of binding site information that you might have in advance, um, and then running a, a suite of tools, and then comparing those results to the uh, targets based on the scores uh, that we just discussed, and putting all this together to see how, where we are basically. Um, and so we ran an initial benchmark on a small set and we had a couple of conclusions from that. So the first one is that the pocket prediction step seems to be really essential for um, the physics-based docking tools. So here, what I show, okay, in, in the next three, these kinds of slides, what I'm showing is for four different tools, uh, these two are physics-based, this one has a bit of deep learning uh, in its scoring function, and this one is purely uh, deep learning method. Um, and I show the LDD TPLI uh, distribution across a, a test set. Um, for in this case, this would be blind docking, so where you have no idea where the pocket is, and you don't tell where you don't tell the predictor where the pocket is, versus if you predict at first where the pocket is just based on the receptor and give that information to the predictor. And so you see that when you give the pocket information, the physics-based methods all do way better uh, than if you don't. And, and in this case, DiffDoc, there was no option to give pocket information. And you see that it already does quite well uh, on this set, let's say, um, without giving the pocket, but I'll come back to the on this set, of course. Uh, one thing that we also noticed is that predicting the pocket given the protein was not a very difficult task on its own. Uh, for all of the cases that we tested, uh, the correct pocket where the ligand was, was in the top three of the predicted pockets in more than 90% of the cases. And this doesn't mean that it's like a solved problem, but it does mean that this kind of information could be incorporated into deep learning methods to really uh, first solve this slightly easier task before going to the uh, placing the ligand task. Um, the second thing that we notice is that uh, we really need to have more representative data sets for benchmarking. So the first, I think this is something that 
uh, popped up quite often. I, I show you uh, also a couple more papers that show, saw the same thing, is the deep learning methods currently for this task of protein lagging complex prediction are overfit uh, to this, the training set that they've used, which is the PDB bind uh, training set. And as soon as you change this to um, something that has a uh, low sequence identity, even in this case, it's just based on sequence identity. If it has low sequence identity to the training set, um, then immediately the performance drops. Um, and yeah, so that that's something that uh, we noticed is, as kind of a big deal is that as soon as you change the set, then you get completely different results. You don't see so much of the trend for the physics-based methods, uh, but again here, it really, these are all small sets. So the this PDB bind time split test set has 300 or so complexes. The one that we used was uh, made to be around the same size. So again, 350 complexes. And what would of course be interesting for anyone who's using these methods in the field is to know how well would it work on something like my complex, my protein or my leg of interest. Um, and so, as I said, this was something that was noticed before is that the deep learning based docking methods fail to generalize. Uh, and especially here, this is the new uh, diffdoc plus, I think, paper um, where they show that uh, essentially a huge number of the pocket residues uh, are identical to those in the training set uh, as the test set. And then as soon as you change that, as soon as you make a split, um, then the generalization is absent, uh, let's say. And this is something that we kind of also, um, it's not necessarily, let's say, it's something to keep in mind, right? That because what we noticed in CASP 15 in PLI is also that the template-based methods were the ones that performed well, and not even the physics-based one. And this, again, for CAS 15 PLI as well, was because of the data that we had, like the, the prediction targets were quite similar to stuff that has been crystallized before. Um, okay, and the third thing that we noticed is that alpha fold models can't be used naively, let's say, for uh, rigid docking. So this is again the, the tools, and then this is with the crystal structure already in the hollow conformation binding the ligand of interest, can you put the ligand back in? And this is the alpha fold structure, uh, if you use that as a starting point. And basically the performance is completely tanked. Um, and the, the let's say the funny thing is that it's not even that you can say that the alpha fold model is bad because even if you just look at the LDDT of the ligand pocket it's quite high like the pocket is even being modeled quite well but especially for the physics-based docking methods it's all about the protein ligand interactions so some examples yeah. oh yeah so this, this is just to show that this we, we were not the first or only ones to notice this. Like uh, there were multiple cases where they show that you just can't use alpha fold models as they are for rigid docking. Um, I think this one was especially interesting because um, they show that uh, even if you use homology modeling with not so great templates, it can perform better for rigid docking than using an alpha fold model, even though the alpha fold model seems more accurate. Um, and a lot of that is really because of small changes. So if you have, here, here are the examples, there we go. Um, so if you just have a side chain that is incorrectly placed in the pocket, then physics-based methods have no chance of putting the leg in there because now it doesn't, uh, it doesn't fit there anymore. Um, and so in a lot of these cases, actually, you see that overall, it may seem like a great structure, but uh, the ligand can no longer be placed in a way uh, that makes sense. So we really need to take confirmation into account. Um, and this, can this I ask model... you one thing? I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I know that people used to generate ensembles of the protein structures and then doctored all the ensembles. So mm -hmm. would that help? Is it, is it, is it... Or is are they are they all bad? It's like if you generate oh. five hundred structures with um, 
yeah yeah but yeah I'm... i see what you mean so we we actually looked into that as well um and it, it really depends like in some cases you can you can make ensembles with quite different um binding pocket like uh, changes in the binding pocket but it does seem like the issue is and also the reason uh, from this paper the reasoning let's say that we came up with that why homology models can sometimes do better is because alphafold was never really trained with ligands so it doesn't know to leave that space empty let's say uh, it does because you know, this is something that also comes up that 70% of alpha fold models are in hollow form because a lot of the PDB structures are in hollow form. Uh, but the, it, it doesn't really translate to the to the actual sidechain orientations because that's it's really dependent on the ligand. Can I ask a question while we're um, asking questions? Are these crystal structures, were they all ABO or were they ligand bound with the ligand? And removed when no exactly the they were they were ligand bound with ligand removed. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. in this in our benchmark that was exactly the case that these were already in the correct form and you just need to put the ligand in and then it does great uh, in in some of these papers though it wasn't the case it was also uh, models from apo and so on which still seem to sometimes do better than alpha full structures because at least there is pocket there uh, I don't know of one which just looked at APO uh, structures, though. Maybe it was more like cross-docked, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this isn't really AlphaFold's fault. It, it doesn't know that plugins are there. Uh, and so this is something that Petr um, from our group is working on, is to try and bring plugins into, into AlphaFold. Uh, it's a bit of a tangent, so I won't go into uh, much detail, but essentially trying to uh, make a generative model within the alpha full latent space and incorporate uh, ligand information to then get uh, ligand specific uh, confirmation of uh, ligand specific alpha fold prediction. Um, okay, so based on those sort of three uh, results from this first benchmark and from TAS 15 PLI and other kinds of uh, experiments that we did in the group, we came up with what do we what do we actually need to, to continue with uh, protein ligand complex prediction. And um, these were the three things. So we need a larger training set for the deep learning methods, a larger and more diverse training set for the deep learning methods. This is something that was uh, also said in the recent dynamic bind paper that you just need larger training sets. Um, because the current one, so the one that uh, I showed the results on, that was only 17,000 uh, complexes. Um, we need representative test sets. Uh, this is both to assess the generalizability of these training, uh, of these deep learning methods, but also for uh, users or people who are using these methods to see how well do methods perform on their uh, task of interest, so on their proteins and ligands of interest. And we need realistic prediction scenarios. It's highly unlikely to have a crystal structure of the bound conformation for your ligand and then need to do docking <laughs> to put the ligand back into that. Uh, it's much more likely that you have either the same protein bound to a different ligand, an apple structure, or a predicted structure. And more commonly, it's becoming the predicted structure is what you have. Um, okay, so we came up with this idea to collect this data set from the protein data bank because in the end, so a lot of these deep learning methods have been using the PDB bind set, which is, as I said, it was a set of around 19,000 protein ligand complexes for which there were some measured binding affinities uh, published. But for uh, protein ligand complex prediction, you don't need the binding affinity. So there is no really reason to stick to this uh, set. Um, and the PDB has a lot of ligand complexes. So we wanted to detect those and we use, uh, so we start with the biological assemblies in the PDB. 
and we detect all the protein ligand -like interactions uh, using PLIP. So this is a tool that essentially looks for different kinds of uh, interactions, hydrogen bonds, water bridges, et cetera, between uh, proteins and ligands, let's say. Um, and so this was already a part of uh, the Swiss model template library. So this is, you can already go here and see this for um, any PDB structure you want, where you can see what are the kinds of interactions that a ligand makes with the protein. Um, then we wanted to look at uh, how good is the quality of this complex. So for this, we look through the PDB validation reports. Um, and this is important because you would see that actually there's a lot of um, structures where, for, for example, there are a lot of structures where uh, you have the same protein and the same ligand crystallized uh, in different labs, in different experiments, in different purposes, and so on. And so what is the correct answer? Like, what do you want the predictor to predict? Um, in this case, for instance, where I've shown the underlying electron density, this is, doesn't have so much support. Uh, so if you would say that the predictor is wrong for predicting this and correct for predicting this, then it's, it's not like you have a lot of basis for that. Um, so you need to be able to see how well it does the how how good is the quality or how much can you trust, let's say, uh, the pose that's in the crystal structure. Um, and so for this, we came up with a number of um, criteria based on uh, um, metrics that are calculated from the electron density and from the coordinates. So for the receptor, if we look at the resolution and, and how well the residues are fitting the electron density. For the ligand, we look at the RCC, and also we look at the RCC of the residues in the pocket, so the residues in the binding pocket. And we came up with some thresholds that uh, basically uh, gives us a balance between not throwing away too much and still uh, having some high quality structures in there. Okay, so with these two, we, we have the pipeline now to Essentially, for every for any bio unit in the PDB, you identify uh, and annotate all the protein ligand interactions. And uh, just to show you how it looks in in the most let's say uh, simple case, it would be that you have a receptor, a protein, uh, a ligand, and they're interacting by some residues, which we can call the pocket. Um, but of course, that's not the only kinds of cases that are in there. You have sometimes two chains. Uh, interacting with the same ligand, uh, this would be a single pocket or system. Um, you can also have in the same bio unit two different ligand pockets. So this would be seen as a separate system than this. Uh, or you can have cases where two ligands are interacting or in the same pocket. So maybe like a cofactor or uh, something like that. So this would again be seen as a, a single system. And uh, so yeah, multi-ligand and multi-receptor uh, systems are also identified. And I put ligands here in quotes because we don't stick to just small molecules. Uh, you can also have peptides, oligosaccharides, oligonucleotides. And this, this allows us to also uh, get a lot more information on, on these kinds of binding um, into the data set. This is something that's actually becoming uh, quite uh, nicely used in some of the recent papers, for instance, in Rosetta Folda Latum and the new diff talk, where they basically take just uh, parts of a protein that are binding to another protein and see that as kind of a ligand-like interaction. Uh, and when you do all this, you actually end up with quite a lot of pockets across the PDB, so more than a million. Uh, and if you remove uh, crystallization artifacts and uh, just systems which only have ions, you still end up with around 500,000 uh, protein ligand interactions from the PDB as of, I think, April 1st. Um, so here's kind of, again, what it looks like. So a system, uh, as I was saying, it's all the ligands within four angstrom of each other and any receptor chain which interacts with those ligands. And if you look at the distribution of the kinds of molecules in these, in these systems, uh, you still have quite a lot of them, which are, let's say, drug-like, like they pass the Lipinski rules and some, and some thresholds. Uh, you have quite a lot of cofactors, um, and you have also fragments, which are uh, maybe, which are not 
so useful in the benchmarking context, but they could be quite useful for training deep learning methods. Um, and in most cases, it's still, there's a single ligand uh, and a single protein chain, but then we also have a, a number of multi-protein chain, multi-ligand complexes. Uh, and we basically have quite a lot of annotations added to these systems. So uh, what kinds of domains are the receptors from CAF, uh, ECOD, and so on? Um, properties of the ligands, what are the binding pocket residues, what are the interactions, uh, all the validation criteria that I mentioned um, from the PDB validation reports for the X-ray systems, of course, these are not for the cryo and NMR systems, and ways to get the uh, files, so the CIF, PDB, and SDF files of the systems and prepare them for, uh, for the physics-based docking methods or for fixing uh, missing residues and, and hydrogenating the systems. Um, and now I'll talk a little bit about these two parts, which is that now that we have this huge set, uh, a lot of it is probably redundant, but how do we actually see what is the diversity of this set and how do we link it to uh, different confirmations of the same protein? So Apple or predicted structures um, that we were discussing before. So that comes to the next point of clustering uh, or detect, let's say, calculating similarity uh, for protein ligand systems. And this we do with uh, a structural alignment of the protein chains, uh, followed by, at first, uh, calculating the similarity of aligning pockets. So given the alignment of the chains, we see what is the, are the pockets in both chains aligned? So this would mean that both of these proteins have a pocket in the same location. Uh, of course, also LDDT of these uh, pockets and uh, the identity of these pockets, all of these are also calculated. Uh, and then the second is the similarity of actually the protein ligand interactions. So given these aligning pockets, how much of these interactions are actually shared? So in this case, we use a sort of a hash made from the PLIP interaction, like this one has a hydrogen bond uh, between these two atoms, does this one also have a hydrogen bond between the same kinds of atoms? Um, so with this, we can make pretty much a big graph of our uh, 500,000 systems connected by the similarity of the pockets uh, or the similarity of the protein ligand interactions. And uh, we use graph clustering methods to look at, the, to assess the diversity of, of this uh, huge set. So essentially, if everything is in the same component, that means that uh, there's some way to go from this system to this other system through a different pocket. Um, and we can use community clustering to basically select a diverse uh, representatives across uh, all of these systems. Um, and especially for the case of benchmarking, then we would select the representatives which have, for instance, the highest quality, um, have drug-like molecules and so on. Uh, yeah, so here are some examples of what this, both the clustering, uh, what the clustering methods allow us to do is to distinguish different kinds of binding modes, let's say. So here's an, here's an example where it's exactly the same protein. It's this, the pocket is in the same location, but the binding mode of the ligand is different. So it, I would be really interested to see if some, if a method has been trained on this, can it actually predict this binding mode uh, of, a, of a different ligand? Um, here's another example where it's the same protein, the same interactions, but the ligands themselves, uh, if you look at just their 2D, like Tanimoto kind of similarity, would seem very different, but they make really similar interactions to the protein. Um, also, what this allows us to do, the similarity methods, the pocket and PLI similarity methods, is to link to other systems. So, for instance, for cross-docking, to get another system which has a similar pocket, uh, to use for uh, docking of a different ligand, uh, to see how different is the apple structure in terms of the pocket uh, and how different are predictive models. And since we have the similarity method, we can split uh, the entire data set into train and test in a way that you don't have this leakage of information between train and test so that we would actually be able to, to assess the generalizability of, of uh, trained methods. And uh, in the context of Camille and uh, CASP, for instance, every time there's a new 
PDB released, we can check uh, we can check it against our full set and see, you know, is it novel in terms of the protein? Is it novel in terms of the pocket? Is it novel in terms of the interactions being made? Um, so here's like a comparison of our set, the Plinder set and PDB bind, which was used uh, before. Uh, it has a lot more systems, like raw systems, of course, but also if you look at uh, the unique receptors and the kinds of domains that are in there, we have a lot more. And um, basically cover quite a lot more of the protein ligand -like interaction space, let's say. Uh, so here in this case, the pocket component is basically any system within this component ha uh, has a shared pocket, at least 50% of the pocket is shared with another system in the component. And this is the same, um, PLI component is the same, but it has shared interactions. So 50% uh, of the interactions are actually very similar. Um, and we have annotated the validation criteria. So quite a lot of our systems pass the validation criteria. Now this is, this is more from the benchmarking perspective. For training methods, of course, it's okay to have some noisy um, data. It's not, of course, that if it doesn't pass the validation criteria, it doesn't mean that the pose is wrong. It just means that we can't trust, uh, we, we can't really trust it as much. Um, and so all of this is annotated and we can easily select high quality cases to where the ground truth is reliable for doing the benchmarking and still use quite a lot of data for uh, training. Uh, and apart from this, we um, calculate different similarities from different perspectives. We link to apple structures, apple chains, and predicted structures. Uh, here, the apple chains are basically labeled as part of the same process. So as we go through the entire PDB detecting systems, we can then label all the chains which are not uh, part of a system as Apple. Um, and this is all automated to run on the weekly PDB release um, so that you can actually see all the systems that are coming out every time. You can assess their difficulty or their novelty compared uh, to the previous set. And uh, in collaboration with Vante AI, uh, we're making this into something that's like has a lot of uh, loaders and utility functions and, and sort of a library for uh, deep learning practitioners to use and to easily train their methods, get nice train well test splits, evaluate it, um, and, and see where how their method is doing and where it needs to improve. So um, coming back to the, to the title, so are we there yet? Here's how we're answering that question, let's say. So we, in collaboration with uh, NVIDIA and Vantei, we're retraining uh, some of the more popular deep learning or some of the more recent uh, deep learning methods with um, the entire Plinder set, so with a more representative diverse data set, uh, so that we can then assess if they are now generalizable with more training with better uh, data set to, the, to a test set that has different kinds of proteins and ligands than the training set. And um, this may seem a bit kind of like annoying in the sense that uh, you're saying like, if you give it more data, then of course it's gonna do better because it can memorize more sort of thing. Uh, but that's kind of the whole idea is that the even though we give it a lot more data to train on, the test set is still going to be now quite different from the training set. And we're trying to, as in a lot of deep learning methods, we're trying to reach that limit where your uh, data set has enough diversity that it's easier for the method to learn the underlying rules than to just memorize all the cases. Um, and then we're, um, again, uh, with NVIDIA benchmarking uh, across this entire space, across the protein ligand interaction space. So using the physics-based methods, deep learning-based methods, and hybrid methods. Uh, so a lot of this is based on Unidoc, which can, uh, which is like a really efficient uh, version of Vina, Smina, th those kinds of scoring functions, uh, which can actually score hundreds of thousands of, uh, of systems. So we can see how well do methods perform for different kinds of proteins and ligands, uh, which would be really useful for um, people using these methods. Um, and we're benchmarking different kinds of scenarios. So not 
the case where you have not only, let's say, the case where you have the hollow structure in the right conformation and you need to put the ligand in there, but you may have an apple, apple structure, uh, a structure with a different ligand. You may or may not have information about the pocket. Um, in the case of lead optimization, for example, you may have uh, a very similar ligand, which now needs to change a little bit. Uh, so all of these different scenarios will be benchmarked uh, in different ways. Uh, using the metrics that we uh, developed uh, also for CAS15 and uh, some of the newer ones, such as uh, reference-free metrics like in Pulse Busters. Um, okay, so I talked about a bunch of different stuff, but I think now most of the picture is complete. So um, we looked into protein ligand interaction space. What is it exactly? And that's all uh, now defined by this workflow that identifies all the protein ligand interactions in the PDB. Uh, we figured out how to calculate similarity in, within this space, so based on the pocket and based on the protein ligand interactions. Um, we looked at the, let's say, the trustworthiness of the ground truth. How much can you trust the pose or how much can you uh, uh, score a method or uh, evaluate a prediction based on this pose? Um, we can we select basically representatives across this space uh, using these different things. So using the similarity to define what a representative is and using quality to try and pick the best quality representatives from across the space. Uh, we link to different Apple and predicted structures and we're also looking into how to generate the kinds of confirmations that are relevant for a lag in the interest. Um, and we can evaluate uh, predictions from perspectives of, uh, from this perspective of joint protein ligand complex prediction, where you want the interactions between the protein and ligand to be maintained. Um, CASP 16, uh, it's going to be quite interesting, it's the PLI uh, part of CASP 16. So uh, the assessor, Mike Gilson, and so the thing with CAS15 is, uh, since it was a pilot experiment, most of the complexes that uh, were prediction targets were sort of, uh, they were submitted for the structure prediction category. So they had interesting uh, proteins, but the, and they just happened to have ligands as well. So it was more like incidental complexes that had ligands or ions, um, these kinds of things. For CASP16, we're, we're, sh we're shifting it towards more targets relevant to drug discovery. So where we have targets and actually series of targets, um, and there's also an additional task of predicting uh, a correlate of binding affinity. So really interesting stuff. So if you have a protein lagging complex predictor, uh, it would be great to participate. Um, yeah, that's from my side. And these are pretty much everyone involved. So the Shrita group, uh, my little subgroup, the picky binders, uh, and we're collaborating with uh, Vante AI and with NVIDIA to, to make this into a usable resource for uh, training deep learning methods and evaluating across this, uh, across all of protein ligand interaction space. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you, you kept us a bit on hold. So do, do you have any results yet of this retraining? Does it help? Yeah, I am. Um, it's... So I think NVIDIA has now retrained like the biggest version of DiffDoc so far or something like this. And it's going well, I can tell you that. I don't know, uh, I, I can't tell you yet exactly how well, but um, losses are going down. <laughs> so, um, but, but are the results in Camille already or the- Not no, yet. No. Not yet, there. so this still is like ongoing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, near the end, so we plan, I think, uh, end of April, quite soon near the end of April, to have everything ready for uh, for showing some initial results, seeing how well uh, things are going. Yeah. Do, do you retrain Rosetta for all atoms also, or? It's also in the list, yeah. In the list, because it's that's quite much heavier to retrain, I would imagine, than other methods. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the, I'm not doing the retraining. <laughs> uh, that's handled by people with a lot of computational resources, so the Vente AI and NVIDIA, but uh, that's also on the list. And also, uh, yeah, I think I had a small, and also G, uh, Nina that would also be really interesting to retrain, I think, the scoring function in- uh, Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Men, men, det måste kvällas som du köper. Jag kan ta det där. Men för mig, det är hål och docking. Sims ska bli lite lilla. I don't know why people still do that. Is it any reason to do it? Because it's, I mean, I'm sure I, we can make something that basically is 99 percent accurate quite fast. It's like it's it's why are people physics is talking? You mean? Yeah, well, for yeah, for whatever method you do, it's like it's. I mean, you have a pre-configured. You gotta match two things together. It's lock and key. I mean, this it's perfect because it's already there. So well, like only if you have the 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 lock in the right way, right? That's that's okay. Okay, the, the lock is still flexible. Okay, I guess like the ligand is flexible the protein yeah. is flexible a lot of it depends on really like that's another thing like what we saw with the alpha fold structures right like the structure is so close to being correct yeah and yet it can't fit the ligand in there because it's really few residues that are actually making the interactions yeah but but, uh, but then, then it wouldn't work for an apo structure either probably no no so basically but it's I, mean, I think the whole docking seems to me, yeah, I remember. Rigid docking, yeah, I agree yeah, that just, docking yeah, seems, is not yeah. super realistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but even if you use it for training, it's a bit of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I mean if you take a GPCR, yeah, I think the, 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 I mean, the hole is like deep down, but broad, broad between many loops. It's like you've got to get a peptide in there. It's like you need to change a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, okay there was a question in the chat by, by Conan, I think. Do you want to... Should I read it or do you want to say it yourself? If I find him. Well, the comment was, could you comment on updated community ranking of go-to method for protein lag and complex prediction and its applications, like Vina, Schrödinger, Rosetta, Bionemo, etc.? <sighs> yeah. If you have information about the pocket, like you, if you can predict the pocket or you kind of know it from other structure, then I think uh, Genina is the is pretty much the way to go. Um, DiffTalk right now, I don't know. The DiffTalk Plus might be a bit better, but the original DiffTalk, it seem yeah. If you have a, a complex that's really different from the training set, it doesn't yeah, work so well. Um, I don't know that much about Schrodinger. I mean, we have the Glide license to also include it in the benchmark, but that's, uh, yeah, it's closed source, so it's not really our uh, priority. And, and these methods that are, they allow more flexibility, are they, are they really doing it better? Or is it, am I like Rosetta for all atoms or UMOL or? Yeah, even... so uh, UMOL is also uh, under trained. So let's see if we retrain it, how it does. Um, Rosetta Fold all atom, we have really few experiences with it so far, but uh, I don't know. I can't say that uh, with confidence yet, I would say. A question from Shoshana? Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, did you look, you know, now that you have all the data, did you look for what you would call cryptic binding sites? In other words, pockets that are really not available in the apo structure and that become available you know in 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 the bound case and then see how how this can be predicted uh, yeah so we do we do annotate this so we annotate uh, the let's say the ldt difference of the pocket in the apo structure com compared to the pocket in the holo structure so we have a lot of examples like this where it's a huge change like mm -hmm. either there's a huge domain shift or or mm -hmm. like the pocket suddenly becomes open. Uh, but maybe I didn't get exactly what you mean by predicting it. You mean predicting? No, where I'm say, saying that, you know, basically using the APA structure, if you have, you know, if you have cryptic binding sites, in other words, binding sites that become available, you know, only upon, upon sampling around, you know, the starting point mm -hmm. or something somehow. That's what, you know, what... Uh, uh, Arne just mentioned that you know you need you need confirmation changes, but how how big you can you know how big you can go, and if you if you have some data on on these cryptic pockets, which the, there is some data there are some databases uh, that developed by the new data set, it would be really nice to see if if you know you you would use the APO structure and you know can you can you can you predict something that would look like the bound case. Yeah, 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 for sure. That would be a really interesting uh, task to highlight, right? So, because in, we do have some co-folding methods in 
in our set. So of course, for the rigid do body docking methods, they would just fail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so in other words, you know, like if you can generate, you know, enough, you, you use these cases where you, you know, generated sample enough of the protein itself yeah. and then see if, you know, on, on these, you know, ensemble of structures from mm -hmm. the cases where you know that there is an apo that there is a cryptic pocket. Does it sample the, cri the cryptic pocket? The cryptic so pocket. what do you need it to sample the, cri the, the cryptic mm -hmm. pocket? And how, you know, uh, what is the, en the energetics of the cryptic pocket? Mm -hmm. Because obviously the binding of the ligand doesn't, doesn't cause the conformational change. The ligand basically, you know, it's a concentration problem. Mm -hmm. So if the concentration of the, of the pocket, open pocket, you know, the, the cryptic, but open pocket, if the concentration is even small enough, but the ligand concentration is high, it will yeah. catch it. So it would be really interesting to look look into this at some point because I think it's, you know, drug companies really are looking for these binding, you know, cryptic binding sites. So I yeah. think this is even a, a kind of a, 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 a side problem which is really important that could help you, you know, to open the field completely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm I have yes, a curious question. Did you, how do you do with lipids? So lipids in membrane proteins, are they there or did you exclude them? They're there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because I mean, they, they, they would be, they're not really, of course, ligands, but they are certainly, there are some preferences. So there are new, some new structures with a lot of lipids in them, McCarian structures that are, I'm not sure they are out yet. They are at least on the way. So I think it's going to be an interesting data set. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. our our goal is to really capture as many as possible, so we don't throw anything out, and we actually include some things which, for instance, a lot of peptides. Uh, which you know, you, is it a protein protein interaction? Is it a protein ligand interaction? I would say more protein ligand, but it's arguable. So we try to include everything because in the end, especially for training, you need to get how interactions work, and mm -hmm. I think you can learn that from all of these. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Uh, I have a little one actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned the training Nina, but if I remember correctly, it was trained on cross docked data set, which is a huge simulated data set made of hollow hollow pairs. So it's bigger than whatever could be derived from kind of self docking only hollow PDB structures. So do you think? if retraining it um, on Blinder would further improve Gnina? Um, so we also have, because of Unidoc, we can make the cross-docked thing with uh, the data set that we have. So you can uh, really quickly dock across hollow structures as well. So can, we can have cross-docked cases. Uh, and, the, and so just to answer the question of, we can still get enough data uh, from cross docking cases as well for retraining. Uh, but also one of the main reasons we want to retrain uh, also Janina is to see how well it generalizes once we do the split. Yeah. So, uh, to see if it actually generalizes or it's just been trained on so much that it has all of that. And if it sees something new, then it can't work. That's something to check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have oh. another question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. do you train on non-binders? Oh, uh, do you have a, a nice data set in mind? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, somehow this is an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. There's not a lot of negative examples, uh, or yeah. even like decoys, for instance. We yeah, try to, yeah, yeah, really yeah. to find like a consistent and reliable source. Yeah. I mean, I the, 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 there is a lot of data for some binding affinities that without structure that you can use. Right, mm -hmm. that's also a way, but you know, it's harder to to get this affinity, you know, position, mm -hmm. I mean, prioritize right. Mm -hmm. But non-binders is is a different mm -hmm. story. But yeah, I mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought whether you had it's any. It's really idea. important. I agree, but I I don't have a solution for it in terms of including it. Yeah. Right. My, uh, yeah. 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 Shunan. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question about the way that you removed redundant or find a re representative 
pockets uh, from a data set. So, so I am. So you calculate the similarity of your pockets using sequence alignment and also the protein, the protein ligand interaction profile, and then use this graph based method to find the representatives. So my question is: in this graph based method, uh, so each node, so I reckon it should be um, a protein ligand ligand interface. Um, so I wonder, I was wondering how sensitive that this method is. Um, like for example, in the, under the quality, you have two molecules here, but they have they might have um, some different interactions. But so how sensitive this method? Like if you have just one or two interactions that's different, um, do is this method are rec uh, recognizing the ligand bonding pose of different ones, or are it still the same? Um. Okay. Yeah. Great question. So. The protein ligand interaction similarity is based on uh, not just the interaction type, but also the atoms that are interacting and the alignment of the pockets. So in this example, for instance, uh, you would have uh, a residue here, for instance, that's interacting with here and the same residue here interacting here, then you have a shared interaction. Um, if it's a different residue interacting here, that can be seen as a different kind of interaction. Um, so the sensitivity, it kind of depends on your task. So for instance, for splitting train and test, we wouldn't just use this because then, as you said, you can get a case where it's maybe a lower quality structure. So the interactions detected are not completely trustworthy. And because of that, it has a very different interaction profile than something else, even though it's actually very similar. Maybe it's supposed to be really similar. So for splitting train and test, we would use more pocket uh, similarity and to a lesser extent, the PLI similarity uh, to make sure there is really no leakage uh, from protein and ligand side. But for calculating representatives across the space so that we can, for instance, uh, give some numbers of, this is my protein of interest, how well do methods perform on this? There we want to sample across different kinds of binding, different kinds of interactions. And here it's, it's way more sensitive. Uh, I don't know if that answered completely your question. Yeah. yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Uh, can I stick the last one? <laughs> uh, when you retrain uh, the, yeah, when you do retraining uh, of models, do you normalize um, somehow the information that you get from the training set, uh, kind of from clusters of many similar protein ligand interactions? For example, I don't know if you have many similar kinases or if you have many ATP binding Mm -hmm. um, pockets uh, do kind of normalize, but that frequency. So this, I think it, it's going to come as a matter of testing the training uh, that, that's currently ongoing. Uh, because, you know, in some cases, redundancy is okay. Uh, you, you can still learn a lot from it, especially for the deep learning methods. If it's redundant, but slightly noisy, you, you still have a lot of learning there. But what we do is we annotate it. So we uh, for each system, we annotate the the protein ligand interaction component uh, and the pocket component and so on. So it's very easy to uh, get statistics of how many of this kinds of this kind of mode is there in the training set uh, uh, to be able to normalize it if that would help. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I might. Um... I just wanted to know, I was curious about the realistic prediction scenario you talked about. Uh, I didn't quite catch the importance of it. Is it relative to uh, scoring functions? Is it relative to uh, other stuff? So I was specifically talking about this case where a lot of benchmarks concentrate on the redocking uh, situation where you, where you take a protein ligand complex, you take the ligand out, and then you try to put it back in. And I was saying that this is not very realistic because in, in a real life use case, you don't have the ligand complex that you can take the ligand out and take, put it back in. What you would have is either an apple structure, a structure with a different ligand or a predicted structure. And so that would be a realistic scenario where you don't have the information. How well do the docking methods do? Okay, thank you. Okay, last question from, from Shoshana. <laughs> I'm sorry, I mean, uh, it's it's kind of a little off, but I think what is interesting also is interaction promiscuity. In other words, you know, if you have similar sequences, similar structures, you know, in the protein family, 
could you try to predict interaction specificity from you know in terms of yeah i mean uh, pref preferences of binding and 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 basically off targets of off target events yeah i i I, I think this is a huge, really important uh, direction, and this is something I'm actually really interested in because I looked at some of the examples, and it was really cool that I could see exactly yeah. the same ligand in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this this is a really interesting question, and very very important ones. For example, you have many many uh, ligands that bind kinases, different kinases, and it's also important mm -hmm. in cancer. So you know uh, you have uh, uh, very you know you have. Uh, uh, paralogs of, of these kinases and and you know if you if you target too many of them you get terrible side effects yeah exactly. so it would be really a great great way you know of trying to at least see whether you can you can rank you know rank the the the, the ligands according to that yeah yeah so i'm for in from this perspective i'm kind of envisioning for each ligand to also have these are the kinds of mods that it binds in. yes yes Great. Okay, so ho let's hope you have something to report yeah. to soon. Yeah. Great. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, yeah we look we look forward one for the paper when it comes out to <laughs> so see thank what's you. used. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. And remind in in uh, one month more or less we have a talk by Kristen Lindorflarsen about disordered proteins. So quite yeah. different. Okay. Quite see different. You. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm.